Okay, let's begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Eternal Father, we give you thanks and praise, and we glorify your holy name, in and through Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you, and the Holy Spirit. One God forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today, I'm going to talk about, I want to start in Matthew 18. So, share my screen. Everybody should be able to see this. Um, and then we'll see where we go from here. So let me kind of um, bump this up here. That's just Warren can be seen. So can you guys all see my screen, uh, Warren? You see my screen, Warren? Yeah. I can see it, Brad. Can you hear me? Am I coming through? Can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. I, I've heard okay, everyone good. so far throughout the whole day. Okay, good. All right. I jumped right to um, Matthew 18, more just like a whim. I opened up to it and started thinking about this. So um, uh, for our CIA process leading up to Easter, traditionally in the church, we go through the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. That's where we take, our, and that's how the, the liturgy works. That's where we take our readings from um, leading up to that. And then you get into Easter season, and when you get into Holy, Holy Week and then the Easter and then post-Easter leading to Pentecost is called mystagogy. Are you learning about the mysteries? So you read from the Gospel of John. John, it, you know, contains more in-depth about the mysteries. It was the last Gospel written, so it's, it's a reflection now that Christians had already, by the time John wrote his Gospel, Christians had already been celebrating the mysteries for some 60, 60 years. Okay, so he wrote it in the late, somewhere between 90 and 100 probably, so you figure uh, Christ was crucified and rose again, and you had Pentecost somewhere between uh, you know, 30 to 33 AD, somewhere in there. So they had been continually doing this. Because what do you say at the Last Supper? Do this. So they immediately began doing that. Um, and it spread, it spread throughout. So that's, that's how the, the, the layout works. Synoptic Gospels, um, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which we talked about. They're called synoptics because... They look the same, sin optic. They look the same, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. In fact, that um, Mark was probably the first one written. That's what most scholars say. It's the shortest. And so it looks like if you if you take Mark and you kind of spread it out like an accordion and stick in parables, you got Matthew and Luke. Um, and Luke is, I mean, excuse me, Matthew is generally thought to be, there may even be, have been an original Hebrew Matthew. We don't have it. But Matthew seems to be more directed to the Jews. Um, so that's a little layout, the Gospels. I'm turning here to Matthew 18. We're looking at this. I'm using the uh, Revised Standard Version Catholic Edition, which I like to use. But um, any, if you're using the Bible as Catholic, make sure your edition is approved by the church. <clears throat> so start here and we'll see where we get to. Uh, Matthew 18.1, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, truly, I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So right here, you know, remember when the gospels were, when the Bible is written, there's no chapter and verse break. It's one, one scroll, one long thing. So these, the chapter and verses were added later to help us. So the way the division works here with chapter 18, Jesus is giving you the theme, so to speak, for the chapter, which is what? Humility, the humility of a child. So in this, he's talking about Christians. <clears throat> now, in, in, in the beginning here, he says, like this child. So it seems he took an actual child and put him, put him in the midst. In fact, I think it's in Mark. He actually it says he, took, he was in a house and he took a child and brought him in and said, like this, you have to become like this child. In fact, there's a tradition, we can't know, but there's a tradition in the church that that child that he took and put on his lap was St. Ignatius of Antioch. Oh, nice. Um, that's a tradition. So there's several of those um, extra biblical traditions. So we're going to look at how we all are children and then what that means. So then the verse five, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. So 
first of all, Christ here, we have this with the child, you'll see in other passages with the poor, um, Christ knowing that he would not be with us physically in his mercy leaves us other Christs. Who are they? They are the poor. They are children. They are each other, the fellow Christians. So he's saying the way you relate to these is the way you relate to me. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Whoever receives one such child. Now, it begins to make a transition here from an actual uh, human child to the, to the Christian being a child. Now, this verse 5 and 6, I'm sure you've heard these before about the millstone. Um, verse 6, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, the word there in Greek is scandalon. What's that mean? So whoever causes scandal, what does it mean to cause scandal? <clears throat> to cause scandal is to offend someone or to sin publicly in a way that causes other people to sin or causes other people to lose their faith. Now, we all can be guilty of scandal by our open sin, um, doing something in a way, can, we talk about scandalizing other people, but I think this applies especially to clerics or people in the church hierarchy, because it's very easy for them to scandalize people. Um, in fact, a scandalon then, so, so that's, we know the word scandal in. So do you know what a scandalon is? You ever heard that? I couldn't use Greek, but if you've, uh, what is a scandalon then? Where do we get scandal from? Scandalon is a stumbling block. It's something that trips you up, okay? So a, a, a little exercise you can do. Imagine yourself, you're walking, you're, you're on the pathway, Christ talks about the straight and narrow way. It's dark out, and you're walking, there's forest on both sides of the path. It's dark. You have a lamp. <clears throat> That's the word of God. So you're living the Christian life, and you got it, you, you're shining ahead like you should be up here. You can't see. You walk around. Suddenly, what happens if you trip over something in the dark? I mean, you're going to go down sprawling. You turn back and look, and there's that stone in the way. This could be your brother or sister in Christ. This could be a bishop or somebody. They've caused you to fall. And when you cause scandal, you tempt somebody to ultimately leave the faith, but you tempt them to sin. Um, so, for instance, we saw, we even used the word outright. We talked about uh, the sex abuse scandal. Why is it a scandal? You know how many people left the church over that? Now, they may have been waiting for an excuse or not. But they cause scandal. So to whoever did that, Christ says, better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Okay, better to have that done. I'm sure you've heard this, this, this thing about the millstone. So another thing that's interesting, Jesus didn't make this punishment up. Um, according to, uh, we have sources, like Greek sources, this was one of the punishments uh, that would be given for certain crimes, and among them is sacrilege, could be sacrilege. So if you desecrated a temple or you, something like that, other political crimes, they would fasten, they would put something around your neck and throw you in the, in the Mediterranean, just throw you down, sink you down. So this Jesus isn't making something up here. So, which makes sense, because he's saying it, if he just, you know, came out of left field with something weird like that, what's, what's he talking about? So when he said this, um, there's actual Greek word for this, to throw something into the water. Like, so you throw people in the water. They would have known what he was talking about. This is an actual punishment that could be meted out to people. Verse 7, woe to the world for temptations to sin, for it is necessary that temptations come, but woe to the man by whom the temptations come. And then he goes into this about if your hand or foot calls you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. If your eye, pluck it out. Better to be maimed or blind to go into the kingdom of heaven than to go into hell. Gehenna of fire. So the hell of punishment. What's, what's he talking about? The church. Remember, all this is directed to the church. If you're not in the church, <clears throat> all that's directed to you from the gospel is what? Repent and convert. Anything above that is directed to Christians, to the church, to those who believe in the Messiah, uh, believe in Jesus Christ. <clears throat> so he's saying... Woe to the world for temptations to sin. It's necessary that they're going to come. There will be temptation. So one of the things we're, we're suffering through this currently, there's divisions in the church, and there are uh, bishops fighting against bishops. Uh, there was a time in the church, not that long ago, you may have some division, but 
for the most part, one bishop from here says something, yeah, we concur. Now, as soon as one bishop says something, or even the Holy Father says something, yet this bishop over here says that's not true, releases something, it's bishop against bishop. This can be scandalous to people, and they want to know the answer. Um, but woe to, them, woe to them who causes that, okay? One of the things I'll point out here, because, because I think we all struggle with this to some extent, is Christ is saying, I will deal with these people. Don't let yourself be scandalized um, because those who are scandalized can easily become a scandal to others. And I've seen that happen. I've seen good Christians, good Catholics, um, both in person and then some people that I don't know, but they're on the internet who were very reliable, good, very devout. And they still, they're still devout in their own way, but they were scandalized, for instance, by the Pope or by bishops or by, by something going on in the church scandalized by by this man and then they allowed themselves to become them to for themselves to become a scandal to other people okay scandal creates scandal so we have to remember that is you have to strike a balance find out what's true um listen to what's good what's good true and beautiful but be careful that you're not scandalized because those who are scandalized if they don't outright leave the church or maybe even if they do, they can become a scandal in themselves, okay? Um, this is very serious he's, because th he's, again, he's on this same thing, this temptation that's caused by scandal. Better to, better to cut off your hand or feet or pluck out your eye than to fall into this. What's one thing, if someone's scandalized and they, they remain adamant and they want to fight against it, but they do it in an untoward way or they do it in the wrong way what sin will soon follow on that and will possess them a lot of times it's pride and then that's what he's talking about <clears throat> so pride will send you to hell quicker than anything so again the theme of the passage is humility that's the antidote to pr pride so if you look when he's talking about sin a lot of sin in this passage is he's talking about the sin of pride when he's talking about the medicine it's humility so Sometimes you may be scandalized, you may be tempted to it. You have to answer it with humility. <clears throat> what is humility? So this is important. There's different ways we could talk about it, but humility <clears throat> is knowing the truth about yourself in relation to God, knowing the truth about the Holy Church in relation to God, knowing the truth about the church militant in relation to the church triumphant, what we are on earth compared to those in heaven, um, knowing that there are sinners in the church okay sinners will be in the church um and i'm gonna i'm gonna go to something else if anybody has any question or comment you can stop me i'm just rolling here okay question yes so <clears throat> is it a sin then on the part of say um a member of the clergy to cause scandal like to to speak scandalously is that a sin because if it is then um, the other question I was going to have is what are we or what is anyone supposed to do about it? And I think he gets into that. The Lord gets into it there about if it is sinful for someone to cause scandal, then what we do is this procedure here where we address them alone. I don't, yeah. but I don't know if that's addressed to like, I guess it probably has to do something with our state and life. Like it's not like yeah. we would go and you, confront you, yeah, the bishop. You normal, you can't. Yeah, that's where people get that's where people get uh, out of hand too. You got to know your role. So if you're, you know, we're all children of God by baptism, by faith, by the grace of God. But I can't if my bishop offends me, or I, even if I know for a fact he's wrong, there's a way to I, I address him. I can't go online and and uh, criticize him in a way that is becomes what they call besmirching him or you know, uh, libeling him or something. Or call the other problem is you got to watch. Um, what, what Christ talks about here, like you were saying in verse 15, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault. You and him alone is the first step. A lot of times people go, well, what am I going to do if Pope Francis offended me by something? I can't talk. I can't call up the Vatican. Even if I did, he's not going to take my call. Well, who do we do? You know, or is this Bono? No. Okay. So what am I going to do? It's a joke. What am I going to do? I pray about it and, and make sure I'm living holy. And then maybe I get a chance to address my local bishop, but probably not. 
This has to do with you and your your brother that's in the same small age household. So remember, as a Catholic, your household, you have the domestic church that's yours as a man. And then what's your the normal life of a Catholic is the parish. That's the most important environment for the average Catholic. It's your parish. This is talking about your brother in in that local church. So if he does something, this is hard too. You ever had, you ever had somebody sin against you? to go to him and tell him. If he listens to you, you've gained your brother. If he does not listen, take one or two others along with you um, so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three listens. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. What's that mean? Let him be to you as outside of the church, okay? Who's he talking to, by the way, when he's saying this? Because then you, the clue is in verse 18. He's talking to the apostles, ultimately. Mm -hmm. So the, the first part may apply to us, but ultimately, what's the lesson there? We can deal with other people. So read if you offend me, or I can go to you, or you can come to me. But if a bishop commits an offense, who's supposed to go to him? A brother bishop. bishop. Mm -hmm. Or better yet, maybe an archbishop, his superior, the Holy Father. If the Holy Father commits an offense, then there's... there's uh, filial correction or fraternal correction which the other thing that the other thing that um the other thing that's a shame or what's the word i'm looking for a lot of people i'm talking about this because i've seen a lot of this i've been seeing this for two or three years yeah but how do you know i mean you can make a video and say uh the holy father said this or bishop so-and-so said this and you can give people information that might be good for them or you can make them rile them up and get them angry um, and you have no idea who's talking to who behind the scenes or what's going on. So it's, it's a lot of surmisal with that. Okay. Um, the, the key there is what's the theme of the chapter humility. Um, if you're addressing someone, you have to be, you, well, um, in the Proverbs, it says, if you, if you, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, if you correct a, a foolish man or an arrogant man, he's going to become angry with you. Don't do it. But if you correct a wise man, to accept it and become wiser, um, and then and then you learn. Were you going to say something? You, like so, let's just say our bishop is doing something scandalous. Uh -huh. uh, we can't correct them. It's not our place. Could you could you reach out to a, a I guess a separate bishop and and advise to? Can you do some correcting over here? Or probably not. Okay. <clears throat> the you go up you go up the ladder. Mm -hmm. um, if it's not, if it's serious enough. Uh, you would go, to, you would talk to your pastor or the vicar of the dean or somebody close to the bishop, if you had that, or you, maybe that's your pastor's job, mm -hmm. talk to somebody <clears> like that. But nine times out of 10, you're not going to get up. So yeah. um, this is, this comes with living in the world. Like you're going to have, you're, it's going to happen sometimes. You're going to have good bishops and bad bishops. And um, what is important though, if there's error, this doesn't happen a lot, but if there's naked error being taught, First of all, the pastors and the churches should, should be addressed. But then if you can do so charitably in humility and, and talk to people that you have around you and correct it, correct the error or say, always assume as well. Here's another, I think this is important. So let's say it's from the bishop, archbishop, even up to the pope. And they say something in error. Always assume they misspoke. Always assume they meant well. Look at the context. Um, I'm thinking comes to mind when you said that, what was it, a couple of weeks recently, Pope Francis said something in an audience about um, the church, the nature of the church and um, heretics or uh, those who are excommunicated, for instance. And what did he say? He said, they're still in the church. They're still your, um, so you can get, you can say, well, no, that's, you know, because a lot of times you're waiting for him to say something. It's an audience. So then you look at, well, what is it? It's a papal or it's a homily very low magisterial, if anything. Homilies are not something usually you put a lot of theology into. It's directed to people. So then you look at it. Can I, can I square this with tradition and church teaching? You can. You have to do that. And you have to do that even if you have to bend over backwards, so to speak. How can I, how can I square that? Well, I can say if they're excommunicated, they've already been baptized. Uh, they, they, have the, they have the seal of baptism. You can't repeat it. So if they've been excommunicated, they come back. Do you baptize them again? No. 
So while it's true that they may be outside of the church, the, the bounds of the church as far as grace, they're still subject to the laws of the church and they can return. Excommunication is more a medicine than a punish. It's both. It's meant to punish and say to other people, don't do this. But to that person, you have to, you have to stop and you have to come back. That's what it is. That's just an example. Because I can look at a lot of things people say and be like, eh, that's, that seems a little weird to me. I can, you know. And this, this is like six months ago, but I remember Matt Frad was complaining about um, exactly that, where pretty much uh, Francis was effectively mistranslated on something. But it was, it was frustrating because every, it was scandalous. Everyone, every, headlines everywhere and everyone's all up in arms. And all it, all his office would have needed to do is provide a clarification mm -hmm. uh, and, and they didn't. So in, in them not providing that clarification when it was clearly uh, a mistranslation yeah. or whatever, would that be sinful on the, I guess the, whoever, whoever the, who's the PR for, you know? Yeah, the, I don't think it would be sinful. I, yeah. Maybe it's imprudent. I don't know. I don't know why they didn't. It would be nice if um, you had more clarity. Or like, the, like, things. like the, like the Biden thing where Biden says, Francis says I'm gold or whatever. And Francis just didn't say anything to uh, correct him when it's clearly that's not what mm -hmm. he, he probably just said. Yeah. You're a good Catholic, you know, and, yeah. and, and not, um, well, that's the thing. Let's say, let's talk about President Biden. Um, did anybody that was was opposed to him or didn't like him or knew the truth about him, did anybody like that change their mind because he said, Pope Francis said, I'm okay? No. And anybody that was going to vote for him already, would, if Francis came out and said, no, he's not, were they going to change? No. Yeah. So I, I can see that's maybe a, bit, a little bit of the diplomat, like, I'm not going to come out to you know, make a fool of this yeah. guy. Or yeah, or, or it even could just be like an instance where like you, it's just a, just a, a meeting between people. Even if let's say Pope Francis said that, it may just be like, oh, like, like, oh, hello. Like, it's very nice to meet a good Catholic. I mean, it may just be like a, like a, uh, a politeness, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It may not be yeah. a, uh, like, uh, like, like, hi, like, oh, like, like, you know, like, hello, my brother in Christ. I mean, it could just be like a night, like a passing remark, you know? But shouldn't we assume well, and that also, the truth? So, so if we assume so, that the president so, told the truth, then what do we do? Because if, if let's, so we, we are supposed to assume the best, right? So putting Francis aside, let's assume that Biden was, is not lying and that he heard, whether Francis said it or not, he heard it mm -hmm. the way he uh, touted it to the media. And then I guess we're, we're you know, it, maybe that's not going to change people's votes and politics, but it could. This seems to be scandalous in that a normal Catholic sitting in the pew who shares the same views, for instance, about abortion, may then feel that they, just like the president, can go and worthily receive yeah. Or in a state of grace, they're still in a state of grace, even though they're <clears throat> actively in encouraging um, abortions. And so now, 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 what do we do? Yeah. Like, no, I, I'm I, not going to go yeah, to Biden, I agree with but you. I have to talk to like my friends. Yeah. I have to talk to like the people in my circle at my level about like, hey, don't be misled by this. Um, and and that happens, I think, sometimes with bishops or others, cardinals in the church who are saying we need to change church teaching or something, or it's out of date. And I, I might not want to go to that cardinal in Germany, for instance, but I do, I think, have to talk to my people in my circle about that, because even I think St. Paul said, like, even if an angel comes and tells you that the church's teaching is wrong, or that there's a new dogma or a doctrine, don't believe that because mm -hmm. it's all here already. We have it already. So, so I, I'm glad you're talking about this because I definitely struggle with what am I supposed to do about this to help other people yeah. who I can communicate with I think, not fall into I think in, a, in an ideal world, which it's never going to exist to the extent, but it's going to be closer to something like the 12th or 13th century in Europe uh, for a lot of reasons economically the way th things were done to a traditional society in an ideal world the holy father would call uh, whether it was a king an emperor a prince or whatever 
there's no precedence then. That's the other thing. You got, I mean, not, not to go into the political realm, but uh, uh, Rome has had to, the church in general has had to adjust to this idea of nation states and things like that. Now it's more, you know, you know that's been the policy for a while since the, since the Enlightenment or the French Revolution. Like we're not going to interfere as much. So yeah, I mean, I think that's a charitable tax. I, I assume Joseph Biden is telling the truth. So then you, you can maybe do what Warren did and be like, well, these are in passing. But it's, there's nothing wrong with telling people and telling yourself, well, I don't need, I don't, Pope Francis isn't telling me, and I don't need, he's not telling me anything new. I, don't, I mean, we, you can see with your own eyes who and what Joe Biden is. He's a politician, first and foremost. I mean, he's proven that. Um, by your fruits, you, by the fruits, you shall know them. So whatever, it, maybe he did say, hey, you're a good guy, you're a good Catholic guy, or you know, good Catholic, whatever you are. Um, and how much does Francis pay attention to this or that? Or what's, I don't know. But the, I think what I, what I would like to stress for, my, for myself and for others is you can't let that get in here on you. Like you have to protect yourself and your family from that, from being scandalized by that. It is a scandal <coughs> to that add the... the was that? No. It no, is a scandal just, that, when you're done with that statement. Catholics in this country are pro, you know, pro abortion and, and pro sodomy and things like that. Tom, do you want to say something? Yeah. Um, so, you know, being a convert, um, you know, it had this been a few years ago. And <clears throat> if the Pope ever came out and said, you're a bad Catholic or you're not this, that, and the other, and it's public and there's articles written on it. You know, that would really turn my view away from the Catholic Church. So, um, and also I feel like you said, it was said by you and by Kevin, it's not the charitable thing to say, <clears throat> well, you're not a good standing Catholic. A, the Pope doesn't know Joe Biden goes to church or doesn't. We can all assume, of course. We don't know if Joe Biden goes to confession, if he's praying or anything like that. So, you know, publicly, for those people that might be on the fence of coming to the Catholic church or whatever to see like, wow, the Pope is starting to judge people. So not only do I have to, you know, answer to Jesus and the God, you know, and I have to answer to myself every, every week at a confession, if I'm a sinner, but now I'm worried about other people judging me. If the Pope's judging Joe Biden, then maybe my local priest will be judging me. I feel like it'd be, even if we know for a fact Joe Biden is a poor Catholic, I don't think it's a, a good move for the Pope to say the truth in that, in that case, to just say, well, be charitable about it, say it in as you know, vague as possible, because I think it, it'd be detrimental to us as a society to try to do our goal to save everyone's soul, <clears throat> personally. Um. I, mean, I, I can see what you're saying. There certainly is. If anybody can make a judgment, it's the Bishop of Rome. Uh, I do think that I, I, I don't think this is a, the same gravity of situation. But if you look at well, this, if you look back during the 40s in Europe, and this was life or death. So you had the rise of National Socialism in Germany. And it was at first. So people, it, it's easy to criticize the church. You were walking a tightrope there. With the fascists and the Nazis, and and, and tr still trying to uh, keep together old Europe. So the, at first, it looked like the Nazis. Well, we, can we work with them? <clears throat> and then it became clear that they were anti anti Christian, anti you know anti church structure. So then you once once the uh, the Wehrmacht is moving, once the war machine is moving, and they're beginning to deport people, Jews, Catholics, Poles, and they're attack. You know, they're going in. Then the Vatican has to make a decision. What do we say? And it happened. If you say the wrong thing, maybe they round people up. But some of them did. Some bishops put out letters, uh, you know, that were to be read every Sunday on Sunday morning, denouncing Nazism. And then other bishops were, you know, seemed to be more in favor of it for certain reasons. Um, so you, that it gets tough when when uh, the church is intermingled with politics. Not that it shouldn't be. I, it, I think the idea that the church should stay out of politics is, has been a poisonous idea. Um, Brad, would it be better just to put the blinders on and not even really 
just kind of live in your lane and not even hear what Pope Francis says. Yeah, if you say. can do that. If you can do that. If I'm it not, doesn't yeah. affect you. I mean, yeah. I'm just saying, like, because like, every, I mean, I just kind of struggle with what you, what you were saying, too. I kind of just get uh, bitter and angry a little bit every time I hear certain things. It's like, you know what, if I don't even pay attention, eh, <laughs> I don't know. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's almost like, I, mean, uh, I can't. Yeah, I gotta stay in my lane. I don't know. I, you know what? I don't know. Like, absolutely. I'm, you know, you know I'm what I mean? not concerned at all with the politics. <clears throat> like, I, whether it was any president in that situation, I'm more concerned with <clears throat> the people who are trying to learn the faith and they're yeah. trying to find whether, like, they want to emulate someone and and in their behavior. And if and so there is this confusing time <clears throat> right now where we're it's hard to know what behavior we should be encouraging or not. And, and that's, that's, so I, so I try to do my best. I, I, you know, I've got four kids like you and, and I've got a lot of people who, who ask me questions and, and, uh, and I am also like, like, so we talked about like, I'm on my circle, but then there's a circle above me that you guys are beyond, for instance, where I'm trying to aspire to learn what you know. And, and I respect you and I want to listen to you. And I, I think you probably should tell other people <coughs> what, the, what the true teaching is too. Yeah. Like I think we have, to, we have to do that. So, so again, I'm not concerned about the politics as much as just people's souls. Like literally, yeah. like, like yeah. Dude, it, let's, so let's I think that, confuse people. That's what I'm talking about. That's, that's noble and that's good and it's normal. Uh, you got to be careful, like if you can, you, know, you, you don't want to do the stick your head in the sand thing either. Um, yeah, exactly. You, it, you gotta you gotta strike a fine line, I think, um, between the two. Um, I have a yeah, it, 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 strange it, thought. It, it, yeah, go ahead. Mark. Can I can I share? All right, so here's a way I've been trying to understand this. Like I actually. Like back when I was sending you guys all those giant text messages when the, after our last Exodus 90, um, I was thinking about like manliness and different things. Like I was really thinking about an issue like this. I'm going to try to say it in a clear way that doesn't like give any exam, any details or anything, but it's kind of like, like I've seen this situation in which like a certain group in the church or um, or there's like an approach. There's an approach where it's like, oh, like I shouldn't criticize my superior. Like that's one way of like dealing with these type of problems. Like I shouldn't criticize my superior because that would cause scandal to happen. Yeah. Whereas for me, the way I look at it is that I almost see it like as scandalous to not bring up the faults of the superior for example, or especially if it's like a, a matter that like that people would be would be able to find and would be shocked to find out or something like that. So because they said it's like then it's like now this is being hidden. So I think that's a little bit creepy, too, in a sense. There's something wrong there, I think, I think. But but here's where I'm getting at. Like, so, for example, I think that in like, I don't know if it's because I think like a therapisty person like it almost helps me. Like if I, I mean, obviously there are many uh, bad things. So for example, with the sex abuse scandal, it almost helps me to understand, like if I really, if some people are well-documented, like their problems they've had, like there are people who've, you know, there's public trials of some, some figures in the church or like there's some details of their lives. And it was helpful for me to like, look at like what happened to them. What did they say? What their background was? What did they say? Like, I mean, and it doesn't excuse anything they did, but for me to know those details actually helped me to understand, not maybe, I mean, obviously I'm not in any position to forgive, but it helped me understand what was going on. And it almost would seem that there would be a more beneficial strategy for groups in the church that have been impacted by different scandalous events. It would seem that like this approach where they try to not talk about it seems to me to like to give the impression that they're hiding it. And so that seems to be like, so it's almost like, I feel like there's like a, um, I don't know for, for lack, of, for lack of a better word, there's almost like an old school approach to avoiding scandal, which would mean don't, um, 
don't share with the faithful things that would disturb them. Whereas today in, a, in an area where you have lots of mass communication, it almost would seem to me that the way to avoid scandal would be to, to be open about problems, but also explain why. Like, so be like, okay, like, why do priests develop? Like, because oh, sometimes if you do some, like, look at, like, oh, this is what this person's psyche was doing. It's not that hard to be like, oh, like, they were compensating for this trauma by that they really went crazy to be a priest. And then, like, they're hiding this. And then as they're, you know, indulging in these other vices, they're then ramping up their, like, seeming holiness. And, like, you just see these cycles. And it seems like a way to actually come to an understanding of, like, you know the problems in the church the problems in humanity the problem of all these different things it almost seems better to open some of these things or maybe to have that that it's not always um because it's dangerous to have like uh, we use the word blinders you know it's it's hard to have blinders it's hard to not see what's happening sometimes and so i think that there's like this there's these differences and these nuances to like what we can see like what we can judge, like we don't want to not use our intellect and not be perceptive. I think that's something that's dangerous too. And it's hard to do that. It's hard not to think something, but there's almost a way in which we have to make sure we don't fall into judgment. And we also try to correct for the fact that we have like a bias toward judging others. So I think there's a lot of like nuances and I'm not sure, like, I just wanted to share that. Cause that's something that I try to like, that I think about a lot um, with a certain situation and it's like, I always am thinking about that, that approach that I've seen of like, okay, like hiding the things versus like, I wish like they just would just be open and just like make this like not, I feel that many would be less wounded by a very open approach, a very like rigorous approach and a very like humble approach. And I think it ties into, you know, what we're saying about humility. So it's like, it's this, it's this balance between um, scandal and vulnerability humility and vulnerability and so i just i just don't know if that's because we're in a different society than we've usually been in where people you know people used to be not really open about stuff or things like that um as much so those are just some thoughts that i had that i just wanted to kind of throw in there because it's something that i kind of bat back and forth in my head privately so Mm -hmm. good stuff Yeah, thank you. What? Uh, what yeah, that, that reminds me when he was talking. That was, so there's a like I like I was saying, uh, like Warren said. Yet again, I think sometimes we're too used to this. Like, we'll just not talk about it. Um, and the other extreme is talk about it excessively. So then you engage in like this, this outrage porn all the time. Like it's just constant all the time. You know, you know, clickbait all the time. This is horrible. This is horrible. Um, in closing, I didn't get to a lot in Matthew 18. Maybe we'll go back to that another time. But I, when we were talking, there's a very famous parable in Matthew 13 of the, the weeds and the wheat, or the wheat and tares, or the wheat and the cockle, it's sometimes called. Um, I'll, I'll go over this quickly, and then we'll close. Uh, this is Matthew 13, verse 24. <clears throat> this is where, yeah. Uh, another parable he put before them, saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field, But while men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the householder came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then has it weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servants said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, No, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and at the harvest time I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. So what's he talking about? You see this in the parables here. He's talking about the church again. Okay, you have in in the same church, you have wheat and you have weeds. Um, And I think it helps. So if you, so what are the weeds then? These are the, the baptized who cause scandal, who grow up with the wheat. So you can't go through, obviously you heard this before probably, you can't go through and rip everybody out of the, you know, you're gonna pull some of the wheat up. That's what scandal does. If you try to eliminate, if you try to go into some kind of uh, over inquisition mode and eliminate everybody. Um, I think an interesting thing though, as well, if you go to the original Greek text and then it's in the, it's in the Vulgate, this isn't just any weed that the enemy has planted. Um, if you read, if you read in 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 the Greek and then in the Vulgate, 
the, the word there is Zazania. And this Zazania um, would grow in Palestine. Um, other places, it talks about a, a weed called darnel. You ever heard of that? Mm -hmm. Which can actually have intoxicating hallucinogenic effects. So some people would purposely put it in beer or whatever. And they'd be tripping while they drank their beer. But the <laughs> Zazania, <laughs> while it grows up, it looks like wheat. It looks like the wheat. It's not till it puts out the fruit that you see the difference between the wheat and the zazani. Mm -hmm. And it goes back to that. You'll know them by their fruit. So you have to let it grow up. They're together. And then when they all bear fruit, then in the end, then Christ sends the reapers. So it is angels to gather up the weeds. And what happens then to the, to the zazani, to the, to the tares, to the weeds, they're bound up and cast into fire. Um, we hear these things all the time, but it's important to remember um, that it's going to happen. There, there are going to be people who, who are stumbling blocks that cause scandal, um, but we, we cannot ourselves be scandalized to point where we're <coughs> tempted to leave the faith or become ourselves a scandalizer of others, um, which can easily happen. My, uh, and I'll, I'll close with this. Myself, I get, like we were talking about, I see something, I get outraged by it. What do I end up doing? I complain to people or I complain to my wife to the point where I've had to stop because she's getting, you know, maybe she's getting turned off to certain things. She gets sick of hearing it. And sometimes people are like, I don't want to hear this all the time. You know, I don't want to hear this bad news all the time. Now, like Warren said, you can't sweep it under the rug, but you need to, you need to hear the good and the bad, and you need to be mature enough to balance it. You know, I think, I think that's the other key because we don't get, I know in the United States, we don't get a lot of balance. And things nuance when we talk about things because that doesn't get people views or that doesn't get people to read whatever a lot of nuance um there is a lot of evil that is done there's a lot of scandal but um like i said just in closing if you're if you're just in closing i think this is helpful if you read something from your bishop or even from the pope and it doesn't seem to jive or it sounds a little weird or someone's telling you the pope spoke heresy or something first of all you be careful throwing around heresy or whatever but then you like i said do everything you can in charity to try to reconcile it with tradition try to assume he's misspoken or look at the whole context you know what what, what was the medium that it was delivered in and and things like that a lot of times you can reconcile certain statements um in a way that you're not constantly scandalized like this is heresy or things like that and then sometimes you're going to hear some stuff that's wild and then you have to be mature enough to deal with it. Um, the world is hungry for true spirituality, true religion. And you see people, there are people, I, I see a lot of young men in their 20s and 30s that are coming in, they're looking for religion. They're looking for, what, you know, apostolic Christianity and things like that. Um, they will be attracted to, they're attracted to truth, to goodness and to beauty so we have a we have a duty to live our lives in a holy manner um i talked to that other lesson we talked about prayer well we're going to talk about prayer with warren we talked about fasting they go together um leading a holy life so that we attract people um and so we're not ourselves a stumbling block to other people coming into the church um <clears throat> so anybody else have anything to add before we close on that Okay, so I'll say a prayer and then I will close this part of the meeting. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now at the hour of our death, amen. Saint Joseph, pray for us. Holy Guardian Angels, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.